thank you for inviting me. Can you all hear me? Is the mic working? Great. So today I'm going to share with you a puzzle that started for me almost a decade ago. So this is the puzzle. At the time, I was a graduate student in David Botstein's lab, and we were studying gene regulation in yeast cells growing at different growth rates. We regulated their growth rates by growing them in chemostats, and it, it, the growth rate is indicated on the top with these bars. And as Ole Molly expected many, many decades before us, we generally saw that fast-growing cells induce the transcription of ribosomal proteins. So that was, in a way, our positive control. The surprising thing was that not all ribosomal proteins were transcriptionally induced to the same level. Some were indu induced a lot by an order of magnitude or more. Some were not really induced, and some even appeared to be repressed. So at the time we discussed this, it didn't quite make a lot of sense in terms of the requirement to uh, make these proteins in stoichiometric ratios, but we didn't have much to go on because these are mRNA levels and uh, mRNA levels don't always correlate to protein levels and this is particularly true for ribosomal proteins. So we just ignore that. And then I went on to do a postdoc in the Venuden Arden lab. I wasn't looking at ribosomes at all. I was studying aerobic glycolysis, again in budding yeast. And as part of my experiments, I measured both mRNA and protein levels as a time course in total lysates, so lysates in yeast. And even though I wasn't looking for a translation, a lot of the signal in my data was dominated by the changes in proteins involved in translation. And surprisingly, some of these proteins were core ribosomal proteins that were changing in different ways. Some of them were going down, and some of them were going up. And because now this was at the level of the protein, I took the data more seriously. Of course, this is still very inconclusive in terms of what's happening to the ribosomes because ribosomal proteins do have extra ribosomal functions. So it's entirely possible that all of the ribosomes, that, you know, all of the proteins that are changing, the ribosomal proteins, are not located on the ribosome. Uh, I also have seen more recently in my lab by studying the remodeling of the proteome of embryonic stem cells as they differentiate and uh, go into neuroprogenitors that again the ratio between core ribosomal proteins changes at the level of total cell lysate. But what is, is this actually reflective of ribosome heterogeneity? To try to get this to this question, I wanted to physically isolate ribosomes, and for that I used a trusted old technique that needs no introduction in this audience. Uh, I'll just um, point out a very important concern uh, with this technique as I'm isolating ribosomes. It could be that the cell lysis damages the ribosomes, and some of the ribosomal proteins get knocked off. And, what, and therefore, they will not be seen in the monosomal and the polysomal peaks. So an important uh, control for that is that they will appear here in the top fraction because now there are single monomeric proteins. We can still, if, by measuring the protein levels in the top fraction, we can estimate to what degree we damaged proteins and what, what we see downstream. Um, and then I did something very similar with mouse embryonic stem cells. Again, isolating their ribosomes and sucrose gradients, and then he physically took these separate fractions and quantified all of the proteins using quantitative mass spectrometry. And I'll take just a minute to talk about the technique and some potential concerns and artifacts what, so that we can really understand what the data mean. We, we don't overinterpret them. Uh, for my measurements, I need to digest the proteins into, pe into peptides, and for that, in some cases, we use trypsin, in other cases, we use lysine, and that's going to become important. But we don't see all of the peptides, we are going to see only some of the peptides, and then we can look at the relative changes of these peptides, and even though we can get uh, absolute quantitation from this method that is much less precise, much more error prone. So for the first part of my talk, for the most part, we will be focused just on these relative changes of individual peptides. And then if we look at these uh, five peptides from RPL12, we may ask, do they really indicate the protein changing? Um, well, they may or they may not. Uh, that may be mostly noise. We have to statistically evaluate if that's the case. Another very important possibility is that these peptides may get post-translationally modified. 
so that it may appear that the relative level is changing because the peptide is post-translationally modified. But a much more quantitative way to look at this data are not the heat maps, but rather we can look at these re relative changes as a distribution displayed as a box plot. And this is what I'm showing here, the relative quantitation of RPS9 in monosomes, the black bars, and polysomes, the blue bars. And the, again, these distributions are the distributions of all unique peptides coming from that protein. In most cases, these are a dozen or more peptides. And we can estimate with a fairly high probability that these changes appear to be real and not just due to noise. But there still remains a concern that I personally was very worried about, that there might be some sort of peptide-specific biases as we do the digestion. So to alleviate this concern, uh, I also used LYC to do the digestion, which has a fairly different cleavage pattern, produces different peptides, they should not have the same artifacts, and the results are quite consistent. So from these data, it would appear that RPS9 is enriched in monosomal ribosomes, while RPL30 is enriched in polysomal ribosomes. Um, okay, so this is from mass spectrometry, but can we obtain a cross-validation of these results by using a different technique that, that is different enough from mass spectrometry as to not have the same biases and problems. Well, the obvious thing to try is Western blots. And Western blots, it's, it, these changes, as you noticed probably from my previous slide, the changes are very small, about twofold at most. And this is hard to quantify by Western blots, so I did a dozen to uh, get quantitative data. When I quantify these bands and plot them as a box plot distribution of the relative levels, uh, the estimates from Western blots more or less match the estimates from the mass spectrometry. So, how about the comparison of the polysomal enrichment of ribosomal proteins between yeast and mouse embryonic stem cells? I wanted to see if those changes might be related, conserved or not, and generally I see a weak correlation, which is suggestive of conservation. These changes can also be seen between different cell types, as here I'm showing a comparison of the ribosomal composition of ribosomes from mouse embryonic stem cells and neuroprogenitor cells. So this is about composition, but how about function? And I'm not going to claim very strong results about function, uh, just take a, take a look at it. So for one thing, ribosomal <coughs> proteins have lots of well-characterized phenotypes when deleted. They're, they're, they have rich, rich literature for most proteins. So one can just look at the ribosomal proteins that are enriched in monosomes and ask, are, is there anything in common between their phenotypes? And conversely, if, you, if we look at the ribosomal proteins that appear enriched in polysomes, do they share anything in common in terms of uh, studied functions? And if one stares at what is known about them, one may see that usually mutations that are common in cancer in this set of genes tend to be gain-of-function mutations. And when those proteins are, are changed in, in cancer, they usually tend, these tend to be loss of function and these tend to be gain of function mutations. But that's really just a storytelling. I, I'm personally not convinced by that. So let's, let's do an experiment. We are going to start with four tubes of yeast cells. They're all wild type, and by definition, wild type cells have a fitness of one. And then in each tube, we are going to delete a different ribosomal proteins. These are among the yeast ribosomal proteins that do not have paralogs, and they're not essential. They can be deleted, and the cells are just fine. And the question is, can we predict what is going to be the fitness effect of deleting those proteins based on their enrichment in the polysomes? And if the audio video people press this button here, we'll see the result. Thank you. So generally we see that the higher the polysomal enrichment of a protein is, the stronger the fitness deficit when that ribosomal protein is deleted. 
And this is true not only for the few ribosomal proteins that do not have paralogs and are not essential, but if we look more generally for the other non-essential ribosomal proteins, I see a correlation between the fitness deficit and their enrichment in the polysomal fractions. And something very similar holds for the mouse embryonic stem cells. Here, just summarized with the correlations. So how should we think about these data, even if there were ribosome heterogeneity in cells? Why should we be able to separate those on the sucrose gradient? And in fact, I don't believe that the sucrose gradient is the best way to separate heterogeneous ribosomes to begin with. It's just a convenient way. So if, if different protein compositions correspond to different rates of initiation and different rates of elongation, the probability of a particular composition being found in either monosomal or polysomal fraction is different. For example, a composition that results in very frequent initiation is going to have much higher fraction to be found in polysomal ribosomes. Conversely, very high rate of elongation is going to increase the probability of uh, a ribosome being in the monosomal fraction. So that's certainly one way to, to think about the data. What exactly is happening, I think we are yet to determine. So if I go back to this puzzle from a decade ago, the question is now am I in any better uh, situation to interpret it? Do I know what's going on here? Well, I can compute the growth rate slope for each messenger RNA just by regressing the mRNA level by the growth rate and that will give me a quantitative estimate of how much that mRNA is being induced with growth rate. And then I correlated that to the composition, protein composition that I had measured by mass spectrometry. And what I see is that these top messenger RNAs that get induced the most are also corresponding to the proteins that are more highly enriched in the polysomes. Now the correlations are on the order of 0.4. They're not particularly strong, and I'm sure that part of that is noise in the data, and part of that is the difference between mRNA level and protein level. There is certainly a lot of regulation that happens between mRNA and protein level. So I just want to finish with this slide um, on, on a slightly different note. As I told you, everything so far was based on relative quantitation because that's the only robust and reliable protein quantitation that, I, that we know how to do. But we can also do relative quantitation relative to standards with known absolute quantitation. And in that case, we can absolutely quantify the, uh, the abundances of ribosomal proteins. And this is a result from quantifying uh, East core ribosomal proteins using this method by having multiple heavy peptides from each of these ribosomal proteins and quantifying the protein relative to those peptides, we can see that there is quite a spectrum in terms of the absolute abundances of the core ribosomal proteins in, in yeast cells. And my lab is beginning to use more and more of this method in uh, also quantifying the absolute stoichiometries in isolated ribosomes. So with that, I'm going to finish by thanking the people who helped me all along the way, who made this work possible, and I'll take any questions that you may have.